But I don't, I really don't have any regrets. I really don't. I've, I've lived exactly how I've wanted to. I've tried my hardest every single time. I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won. Or, but I really gave it my all. So that for me is enough. Hello everybody, welcome to episode 95 of The Body Serve. I'm Jonathan. And I'm James. And you are officially Twitter famous now. Oh my lord. So much happened yesterday. Uh, Venus won. Maria lost. So good, good. And then I tweeted a quote from Venus's post-match interview on court. And all of a sudden it started blowing up. And then I see this notification that says Chelsea Clinton quoted your tweet. I'm like, what? The clearly not the, the same Chelsea Clinton and it was like how does that happen I'm just enjoy it really. so it's by far you know my most successful tweet the the thing is it only really gained me like four followers <laughs> but I am so grateful it was amazing that is only one of the pieces of good news for you because Serena had her baby as well Man, I'm like now, so it's been what, three days, two or three days now, and I'm just thirsting for more information. I've been parked on Snapchat, waiting for something, not even a glimpse of the baby, just a name or a confirmation from the Williams camp. I guess Venus is the only one who's confirmed. At what point did you accept that this baby was A, happening, and that B, was something to be celebrated? Um... Probably like around Wimbledon. <laughs> well, the the news of the baby came, and then Venus had to go out and play shortly after in her third round match, and she went out and she won. I don't know how she did that. So, I think Serena was in labor overnight, and then had the baby at some point during the day. I'm sure Venus was aware of all these things long before we were, but she had to go back on the court and again, just like at Wimbledon, put all those personal things aside and just go do her job. And she did it. She was playing Sakari that day, which, I mean, it's a match she should win, Mm -hmm. right? But she really just put everything aside, went out and did her job quickly and efficiently and waltzed into the fourth round. Where she beat Carlos Suarez Navarro and is now into the quarterfinals. Mm -hmm. The Suarez match was a little bit tricky Venus has lost to her three times, and she gets a lot of looks that she probably doesn't really like. A lot of retrieving. Carla was actually a lot more aggressive than normal, um, even on her serve. So that was kind of a different look, probably not exactly what she was expecting. She had a fairly bad second set. I mean, it wasn't horrible, but it was, okay, you need to get this together. The ball toss was a little bit wild. The serve needs a little bit of help, but I think the third set was really impressive. She just dialed in, remembered, you know, this is what I can do, and and got through it. Ball toss has been something that Venus has actually worked on and has been able to make effective this year. Like, Mm -hmm. she hasn't had as many, oh, sorry, catch the ball toss moments this year than she has in the past. Right. But yesterday was, was a flashback. Definitely. The pre-tournament favorite, the person we probably would have picked to win, Muguruza, she went out last night to a peaking Petra. Man, (laughs) I mean, like, there's nothing in tennis like Petra at her peak. And so she went down 1-4 in the first set. It looked like, okay, if this is going to be a long match, Petra has got to step this up because Muguruza is the kind of player who can get a lead and hold on to it and just race to the finish line. Like, she's becoming that kind of player. But from 1-4, Petra just started, like, locking in. I mean, the forehands were just, like, on fire. It was seriously impressive. Petra is one of the few people who, it doesn't matter how well you yourself play from the baseline, she can one-up you. I mean, who are the people who can really hang and stop her from the baseline? Serena, uh, I don't know if Venus is even that person anymore. Well, 
I mean, Venus stayed with her and bested her on many, many points in Wimbledon in 2014. Well, that was grass. You know? I feel like the right. surface helps in that situation. On hard court, it's a little bit more difficult for Venus, especially since, she, let's face it, she is a step slower as mm -hmm. well as she's playing now. But I think that pet hard courts are a challenge for Petra as well. Like, grass was the ideal surface for both of those players at the time. Yes. But my point is, when Petra is at peak Petra, this is what we're talking about, yeah. right? At, I mean, to me, it was just shocking to see a player who was zoning like Muguruza for the past few weeks be pushed back on her heels, really to be at the mercy of Kvitova in most of the rallies. Like, if Petra was able to get on top of her, like, the point was going her way. Um, so that was, I mean very surprising to me. I thought it was going to be a long, long three-set battle, and Muguruza's forehand was was misfiring, but it's not like she was playing that badly. It's just, like, what what could she have done? She didn't even seem that mad about Steph at the match. You know, she congratulated Petra, signed some balls before she left the court, head held high, you know? Mm. This, this kind of stuff happens. Elsewhere in the women's draw, so we'll have on that bottom half Venus and Kvitova in one quarterfinal, the other quarterfinal that's been settled, Sloane Stevens beat Gerges, and then Savastova beat Sharapova. So Sloane Stevens will play Savastova in that other bottom half quarterfinal. Mm -hmm. We'll get to Maria later, right? Yes. Because that'll be a whole thing. The Right now, the, the Labor Day matches are going on. I can see that Davi Goffa and Rublev are taking the court right now. Rafa and uh, Dolgopolov are in the first changeover of the match. Mm-hmm. And in that one, well, I don't know what the score is right now. It's 2-1 somebody. I don't know if Rafa broke. <laughs> but Pliskova played already today, and she completely destroyed Jennifer Brady. 6-1, oh 6-love yeah. in 46 minutes. Rafa has the break. It's 2-1 Rafa in the first Good, set. Because I will not abide Rafa losing to this disgusting pig who may or may not be a betting cheat. You know, no slander here. That, that was a mayor alleged. <laughs> mm. He is somebody who uh, has pedophilic tendencies is that oh my <laughs> speaking of slander i thought we <laughs> no it was those nasty instagram photos with like the disney princesses bound and gagged and mm. weird weird shit like that allegedly but pedophilic tendencies not right no not pedof well i get there's an argument anyway i fully expect him to suffer a suspension after this tournament when the investigation is carried out but I'm not saying he's guilty just, you know, disclaimer So Pliskova gets the winner of Vandewey Shavasheva and then the other top half quarterfinal Svitolina plays Madison Keys in the remaining fourth round yeah. to play the winner of Kazetkina and Kanepi Those are, like, those are really tough round of 16 matches on the top half Vandewey managed to uh, sort of weasel her way out of the uh, Radwanska magic. Uh, that dress, that little pastry-looking dress was giving her some mojo. Aga is back, I think, but Coco put in a good performance. She did what she had to do. See, I got the totally different impression. I thought that uh, a peaking Aga or an Aga who is the ninja would have gotten mm. through that match fairly easily oh, in really? the end. Yeah, I didn't see a whole lot of magic from Aga in that match. Okay. But uh, the Vandewey Shafajova match is very intriguing. Uh, Courtney Nguyen unleashed a great thread about the stories that are going on in the, in the women's draw right now that I highly recommend you look at. Like, Lucy was suffering so badly from that infection two years ago during her biggest season, and she's She's just sort of quietly come back, reached number one in doubles, and it's almost like nobody's really noticed. I, I think the tennis world doesn't grasp what an achievement this has been. She is, of course, the 2015 French Open finalist mm -hmm. who beat Ivanovic in her last hurrah, as it would turn out in that semifinal. Right. And then you have Svitolina and Madison, and I really, like, I don't know how to call that one. Madison got it done against Vesnina. It took her three sets, but like she has, I, th I really think she's thriving from the crowd and the confidence is building. So I think that could be a really exciting match. So much so that she requested to play the second night match mm -hmm. tonight. Yeah, which 
part of it could be like sleep schedules because she was so knocked out of whack by that 146 finish. That said, a, Svitl- a Svitolina that's playing on top of her game bests a Vesnina that's playing on top of her game. Oh, yeah. So this yeah. will definitely be a step up or two from her previous match. Mm-hmm. I mean, Svitolina has beaten everybody this year. I think it's a matter of doing it at a major, like we've said before. And I think the time is coming. Madison represents a pretty big roadblock, though. Betting money would have it at this point that Pliskova will play the winner of Venus and Kvitova in the final, right? I would think so, yeah. But you never... Really, you never know. Like, this tournament has been so unpredictable from even before the draws were released, so, man, I don't know. You have a note here that you wanted to talk about Muguruza in terms of she's the one who really, quote got dicked around by this country. <laughs> well, it was in the context of all that Maria Caroline drama. So Caroline, here's the thing. It looks petty when you say these sorts of things when you're the losing player, especially if you've lost early. But the content of what she was saying was not wrong. No. Like she's the number five player in the world, scheduled to play on a small court, court five, fifth on after 11 o'clock. She's made six finals this year. She's had a hell of a year. She's one of the best hardcourt players in the world. Two-time finalist at the U.S. Open. And she can even get a sniff of Arthur Ashe. Mm-hmm. Whereas Maria Sharapova is getting the red carpet treatment right out to Ash every single match. Right. And this was the day when like a hundred matches were scheduled because of the rain delay. But who's first up on Ash at 11 a.m.? Eugenie Bouchard and Rodina. Bouchard, um, who still why? has an ongoing lawsuit against the USDA. Yeah, so my question here immediately was, in the context of this lawsuit, why is she on Ash? Is there something going on behind the scenes that we don't understand? Such as? I don't know. I don't want to speculate and be wrong. There's... But it's it's absurd. Like, it's ridiculous. She's ranked in the 70s. Her opponent was ranked in the 70s or 80s or something. Um, there's absolutely no reason for her to be on Ash. Is she a big draw? I don't even know. Like it, Outside of Canada, I have no idea. Is she selling tickets because of who she is? That's a good question. But There's always something going on behind the scenes that we aren't privy to. <laughs> right. It's, it was just bizarre to me. And the thing is, Caroline Wozniacki is also a big draw. And she's conventionally attractive, if, that, if that's what it really is, you know? But because Bouchard has never made the quarterfinals at the U.S. Open. like People remember that she had that great season back in 2014 where she made two semis and the final of Wimbledon. But she only made the fourth round that year. She's and, never had that big success at the U.S. Open. Yeah, and, and those days are, are long ago. She really hasn't had a whiff of success in a long time. But so She did beat Maria. Well, that's true. So Caroline said that. Maria came back and said, you know what, I'm in the fourth round. I don't know where she is. Which, okay, like, the white gays go mental over any little bit of rudeness from Maria in College Shade. Mm. Like, y'all, it was, it was amusing. I'll, I'll give you that. You did, I did laugh. I did laugh. But not everything is Shade. Shade takes a little wit and a little subtlety. Are we going to talk about Maria now? Le- uh, yeah, this would probably be a good... A good segue. Maria gets the Ash treatment first match, fine. Night match, fine. Gets it out of the way. It's the subsequent every single match <laughs> mm. that then becomes a little bit, eh. And then we have these conflicting ways that she's been talked about by the commentators, by people on Twitter, blah, blah, blah. She's either the second coming or the pariah, mm-hmm. right? And when you have somebody like Chrissy Ebert, saying in a match that, oh, she looks so much different. The thing that, that's most different for me is her speed around the court since she took those 15 months off. <laughs> As if that were voluntary. It was, on, it was maternity leave. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, Chrissy said just a few months ago that she didn't think Maria should get a wild card for the majors. But, I mean, she was her biggest cheerleader at this U.S. Open. 
I think if you're on site at the tournament, you're probably getting a really different look because ESPN is, I mean, they were beating the drum hard. They were doing all these packages. It, the triumphalism of Maria's return was just weird. Like, I don't, I don't know how else to describe it. It was just very weird. It feels like they're probably catering toward the dumb viewer, right? The casual viewer who probably, let's face it, doesn't even remember or know what Meldonium is. Mm. Like, how big did that story play? You know, are people who are casual fans that up in arms about it? I mean, to their mind, if you are a drug cheat, you're done for good. So the, the fact that she's back and her PR game that she put into place after the cast decision. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's probably swayed the public perception in ways that we are not even considering. Right. And I mean, there's a lot of propaganda out there about Serena and Venus's therapeutic use exemptions. So there's this like muddying of the truth that is very much of this time, that is very Trumpian. It feels like bots, but saying, Oh, well, she just used this minor Latvian drug that everybody takes. Can you believe these serious drugs that Serena and Venus take legally? And it's like, okay, so now you're saying that it's no big deal. And the thing is with the Sharapova suspension, the science on meldonium is not clear. Um, It may not really have much of a a performance enhancing effect at all. Like we, we simply don't know. And she was taking it legally for many years and then removed it from her, from reporting. So the thing is, the... What, are we going through the, are we relitigating this again? No, but you can see it in relief here that the, the reaction, like her defense was worse than the crime, in my opinion. It was just graceless from day one. And this is why I think I have a lot of like, my reaction is not purely intellectual. It's just this feeling of grossness. The just the celebration of the return as if she were out on vacation, you know, or needed to regroup or something. Well, it's a reaction to when, as a learned person, somebody speaks to you like you're an imbecile. Mm -hmm. That's something that's a guttural, very offensive thing. That's one of the most offensive things somebody can do to you, Mm. right? And so the her evoking her little black dress and the Swarovski crystals and behind all this I'm just a regular girl and I just I'm fighting for every match like that made me sick to my stomach to hear it the the encore question afterward was well after all this time off what what do you want to say or something like that and it's like she took a deep breath and she said well behind like you said behind the little black dress infantilizing herself Mm. the little black dress the swear off this crystals the big Evian water bottle the Porsche car behind all these you know <laughs> the sponsors, sponsors that I'm gonna left. name drop mm-hmm. right behind the head racket there's this little girl there's nothing about Maria that's a little girl no. at this point no. she's a calculated successful businesswoman probably first over a tennis player at this point and if there were an attempt to even get in the vicinity of authenticity in that comment. It just wasn't there. No, But it's well-crafted, it's calculated, it's Swiftian. It positions herself as the innocent girl who just wants to play tennis and these people keep fucking up her life, right? And so this is all part of, I believe, the book rollout as well, which will position Serena as the big bad wolf and Maria as this helpless young woman who just wants to, you know play tennis, win matches. I just don't Listen, know why she's so obsessed with me, why she has to beat right. me every time. She's so intimidated by Serena. She's got a good six inches on Serena. We'll go into this when I read the stuff from the book, which I expect will be horrifying. You, you already said you're not going to read the book. No, but I have to. Or the chapter. You well, said you're not going to do it. Well, we have to read that. I said I was not going to buy it. No, you said I you said. weren't going to read the chapter either. Oh, well, I have to. Because now I'm curious. The thing is... Ugh, with (laughs) like i don't care that she's back i really don't care that she got a wild card like i'm in no way upset about it because it's over right like she's been ready for it to be over for a long time she served her 15 months you're back cool that's great i don't care like i'm not gonna sit here and be upset about it because you you served your time it's just the reception was 
mind-boggling to me. And I expect it. It shouldn't be because it's expected, but, like, are there other sports that do that? And I'm asking, uh, like, genuinely. I don't know. I, don't, I'm, I haven't done research. You, no, Maybe but, you should have asked me that question before we went to air, <laughs> and then I could right. have looked into but, it. But, uh, like, other people who are convicted on doping suspensions in other sports, I feel like the reception is not the same. We are also not in tune with the fan bases of those sports like we are with tennis. Mm-hmm. What about ESPN? Like, it was just the whole structure was ready for the return. I mean, this is a tennis thing. Mm -hmm. In between sets of every tennis match in primetime, there is a vignette, no matter where where it is. Mm -hmm. Who it is, rather. So, like, there was going to be a Maria vignette. It's just a matter of what it was about. I do think it's disrespectful for the players in the draw who have been the faces of the WTA since she was gone as well. The WTA is obviously, I mean, they need to make money. Right, and Maria is, without Serena there, perhaps even with Serena there, the biggest money maker in tennis. So, clearly they need her, but don't they also need Venus, and Pliskova and Muguruza and Petra? Like, aren't these also great stories? Well, which is where Muguruza got dicked over. Like, she's the one. Well, that's not the WTA. This is right, the right. scheduling of the USTA. But for the most part, the top women have been getting to play on the big courts. Caroline got shafted. Muguruza got shafted. Pliskova has mm-hmm. played uh, on big stages as a number one. Venus has been there, unlike at Wimbledon. The home tournament here is, I guess, doing what they do for Kanta and Mari at Wimbledon. Mm. Like, she's getting the proper treatment. Uh, I don't know. All right. You want to move on from Maria? Yes. Let's. <laughs> so, let's talk about some men's things. Roger and Rafa had some rocky starts. I think Roger especially. I've... It's rare that you see him play ugly matches like that in his first two ma- first two rounds. His first match against Tiafo was unlike anything I'd ever seen. Went from looking on top of the world to playing like he can't find the court or get over the net. Clearly hindered by a stiff back. I don't know what the extent of that back injury is, but he was hindered. And the match lasted two hours and 37 minutes for a five-set match. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was one of those unwatchable five set matches where there's no momentum, there's very little interesting happening, the points aren't exciting. It's just like, who is this guy? I mean, all respect to him that clearly he was suffering before the tournament, and it looks like his body has loosened up a little bit, but you know, he's here and he wants to play, and he may just well play himself into form based on his. The last match I saw him win. He's still probably going to win. I still maintain that. Even after being on court for so long? Yeah. I mean, for so long, it was two hours and 37 minutes of not very physical mm. tennis. If he can get the back right, I mean, everybody he's playing, he has a unbeaten record against him before he gets to either uh, Del Potro or team yeah. in the next round. I mean, but he could not have asked for a better draw if he were hurt. I mean, of course, he has great records against almost anyone and his big bugaboos are not even in the draw but like Feliciano did nothing to trouble him like that match was such a stinker in my opinion Feliciano played well there's just nothing about his game that troubles Roger he did all right and I mean the backhand is just such a liability Nadal had a couple of slow starts to start the tournament he's now up 4-2 against Elgapolov as Mm. we speak which is a bit of a a course reversal for him thus far, because he's lost the first set, I think, in every match he's played. Yeah, he's been starting very slowly, and I was a little worried about this match, and, I mean, it's still going on, so I'm not going to jinx anyone. he was up two sets to love against Fonini, okay? Mm, Just true. dial it back Very a true. Bit. Oh, we'll talk about him later. Uh, the match that I was kind of most excited about in the first week, can you guess? It was the Halep. No. Sharapova match? Well, the one I most enjoyed watching was Chorich and Sasha Zverev. Mm. Because you are now, he's now public enemy number two or three but, for you? No, I'm just, well, I'm fully on board the Borna train. Now that he's old enough, he's grown up a little bit, and I just like watching him play. I like his fight. He, he went out there with a game plan, and he executed, and he just... I mean, there were so many times where he could have folded to the better player, and he didn't. And I just liked the the fire that I saw. 
He has, I mean, he has big wins against big players, mm -hmm. you know? He's beaten Nadal twice, I believe. I think so. Definitely once he's, in Cincinnati, I saw that match. Djokovic, he beat Murray uh, this, this year on clay, and now Sasha Zverev. Nobody had more momentum going into this tournament than Sasha Zverev. He probably just ran out of steam. It can be a little bit mm. tiring being that uh, surly and snippy <laughs> all the time. Yeah, I think more people are starting to notice that he has like an attitude thing. Not to like beat too hard on this, because I still think the kid, well, he's still kind of a kid. And I think if he grows up more like his brother, it'll be easier to take. But I don't know. I think his fitness is still a big issue. I think there was a lot of like, there's a lot of disagreement on that, but I think fitness was a problem against Borna. Nadal's, we, you kind of just brush past Nadal's slow starts. Okay. But you'll get to hear more about that from Rene Denfeld, who is going to be at the end of this episode. Mm -hmm. He's been in his press conferences, and we asked him that question about what, what to make of Rafa's slow starts, and you'll get to hear his response to that, since we've been deficient in <laughs> answering that. There's just too much to cover here. The rest of the men's matches, we'll start with the bottom half, where Sam Query was lights out, like I've never seen anybody be lights out last night. Oh my god. It was unreal. I don't want to see that shit again. I hope that was like lightning in a bottle, and that's it. So he beat Misha Zverev in his fourth round match. Kevin Anderson, who was my dark horse pick before the tournament, he's alive in the quarterfinals. He beat Lorenzi. So Query and Anderson will play for a spot in the semifinals. And then Karenio Busta, he beat Wonder Kid Shapovalov <laughs> in three tiebreak sets. And Diego Schwartzman, little Diego, he takes out Pui. And so Karenia Busta and Schwartzman, they'll play for mm -hmm. a spot in the semifinals. So between those four players, well, amongst those four players, Query, Anderson, Karenia Busta, and Schwartzman, one of them will definitely be a first time Grand Slam finalist. Yeah. Query and Anderson are really the only one only ones with late round experience. And Query Query's is very new. It was the semi at Wimbledon, and that was pretty much it. So he's the U.S. number one again. Kevin Anderson, you would have picked, Renee picked, to, to get out of this messy bottom half. And I'm still kind of leaning toward Kevin, but he's got to hope that Sam doesn't have a performance like that again. <laughs> that that was a one-time thing. Because I feel like Sam could win the tournament with that kind of performance. And believe me, I don't want to see that happen as much as all of you. On the top half... Nadal is playing Dolgopovlov right now. These are all fourth round matches still to be played. Goffin and Rublev are in court as well. So the winner of those two matches will play in the quarterfinals. This is where Dimitrov should have been before he went mm -hmm. crashing out. Federer will play Cole Schreiber. And then Dominic Team will play Del Potro, which I think is the marquee match yeah. of this entire fourth round. And it's stashed on grandstand. The last which on I, grandstand. I it don't just understand. Got stuffed there like an overthought, an oversight. Bottom line, we're still on course for the first ever Fedal meeting in New York, which I'm not sure anybody on either side of that fandom wants to see. <laughs> you know what? At this tournament, it's not going to be pretty if it no. does happen. It's not going to be a classic. I mean, so many of them haven't been pretty. Mm. But also, I don't think anybody feels like they need to go through each other to, to have this title be justified. Yeah. They've both won slams this year. They're clearly the two best players in men's tennis this year. And for either of them to win unencumbered would have been like, okay. Right. Nobody's going to be mad about it. Except for well, the opposite the, fan base. The partisans, of course. Yeah. Do we want to talk about Dennis? I mean, I feel like it's a big oversight if we don't, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's he's somebody that has been on my radar a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you actually, you, you were looking at him years ago. Yeah. Two years ago. And uh, when he beat Kyrgios mm -hmm. at the Rogers Cup last year, that year in particular, I saw him a lot around the grounds at the Rogers Cup. And he and Felix practicing a lot was able to watch a lot of his game. And even from last year, I mean, I don't want to say even from last year, because when you're 17, you develop quickly. The gap between developing at 17 and 18 and 
say, 29 and 30. Mm. It's, it's much bigger. But he's a totally transformed player. A lot of that has to do with confidence as well. It's beneficial that a lot of players have not seen his game before. So he took a lot of people by surprise. But the kid is explosive. He has a good serve. He's got that lefty look, that lefty forehand. And I think after the whole unfortunate, you know, bashing the umpire in the eyeball thing at Davis Cup, he's turned around his image and you you really believe that he's kind of a good guy. Like you know, I don't feel that bad rooting for him. <laughs> and I was I was resistant because I'm very slow to to kind of relate to new players or get excited about young players. But I, as the tournament went on, I started to like him more and more. You also and, said he was very ugly. Well, yeah. Don't, Which I thought was really rude. Uh, don't be blinded by the, the blonde hair and the blue eyes. Mm. The thing about his game that I find refreshing is he's relentlessly aggressive. He's always looking to come into net, even though he's not very accomplished at net. Mm. And he'll still make some horrible decisions and volleys. Everything about his game is constantly coming at you. Beat the serve, beat the power. He has such, I want to say, surprising power because you look at him as a, mm-hmm. a wiry kid and it must seem a little bit strange to then have him be hitting 130 mile an hour serves and blazing ground strokes at you. Right. And the way men's tennis is now, I think it may take some years just to sort of build up that fitness and strength because men develop a lot later than women but I mean this I don't know I don't want to say what the ceiling is because we really have no idea like some players never happen some unexpected players become great so you know well he'll be top 50 now after this this showing at the US Open Rafa has just won the first set 6-2 over Delgapovlov that's our live update Mm -hmm. that you'll be getting delayed (laughs) Shapovalov more than anything is a, a a cliched breath of fresh air, especially for us being tennis fans living in Canada. There's just so much, so there's only so much Milos and so much Bouchard you can you can deal with, and with Pospisil not playing well for an extended period now, this is a fun story. And then Felix is going to be coming up shortly after. Hopefully, mm-hmm. we've had uh, Francois Sabanda on the show. The future of Canadian tennis is bright, with exciting characters so that's where i'll leave that and sadly he beat my joe badly that's where your like, your presitude came he in. Em- he embarrassed joe I-, I mean i actually had to turn it off joe embarrassed himself i maintain <laughs> he played himself i think it's time for see what had happened was mm-hmm. and you can probably guess what it's going to be let's get through this quickly okay fonini once again acting a damn fool mm-hmm. this time in his singles match in his opening round he goes on what people are rightfully calling a sexist tirade. Mm-hmm. Also, you know, just real fucking rude. And out of line, despicable, piggish behavior. But in keeping with who Fabio yes, is. Yes, this, is not, this mm-hmm. is not new. You want to say the words that he, he called no, the No, I mean, you can look up the words. They're pretty bad in Italian and English. No, so. I mean, like... People need to know if they haven't heard. Oh, so he, he said Troia, which means whore, and Bokinara, which I'm not going to translate. I think that's like a step too far for us. <laughs> Don't you think? I, I, if that's your choice. Yeah. But And this was directed at the chair umpire, Louise Engzel. Um, so at first he was fined $24,000, which was the limit. And then later, I guess four days after the match the U.S. Open announced that he had been defaulted and he had to leave the tournament. It's a, some Grand Slam board that mm. they do. All four Grand Slams had to then convene and decide. Right. Because it's, it's a serious thing to kick a player out of a Grand Slam tournament. Because he was still in the doubles. They had won two matches and were set to play their third. And he was removed. His, um, his partner, Simone Bolelli, can't play, obviously. Which Renee talks about that with us a bit, mm-hmm. and my feeling is like you you made your bed, like you know who he is. Now my question is, what about the doubles teams that they beat? I don't I don't really know. Yeah. What to say? I mean, it it sucks for them, but it like, does suck for them. What can you do? Why did the decision take so long? 
Apparently, the excuse they gave was that the Italian translation took a while to contextualize. <laughs> like, re- really? It's Italian. It's not like a dead la- ancient language. It's not that hard, people. And the thing is, like, Fonini has been allowed to carry on with this behavior for so many years that I guess he assumes that it's okay and that it was sort of accepted by the tennis powers, right? I One of the, the things that I've written for thebodyserve.com that's probably been, could probably be the most read of over the three plus years is um, Fabio Fonini and it was Men Behaving Badly, colon, Fabio Fonini and the ATP's culpability. And the, the whole gist of it was that the ATP has allowed him to run amok for years. Mm-hmm. And this was three years ago. And at that point, it had already been going on for years. And these fines back then wasn't enough to stop anything. And right. he's continued to behave like that. And even worse than the behavior, as bad as it is, is his just horrible apology. In a sense, a oh, non-apology. Yeah. And he said, you know, I've gone on with these things a lot, but I'm usually right. That's not an apology. What are you talking about? You're usually right. So I always look at this from a workplace perspective because I work in HR. (laughs) So for me, I think we need to see tennis as a workplace more often because it'll, it puts things into clearer perspective to me. If you sexually harassed somebody at your job, and that's what this is, sexual harassment. If you do that, do you expect to be at work the next day? If somebody called you a whore and worse at your job, would you expect to see them at work the next day like nothing happened? And the umpire is just supposed to sit there and take it? Uh, Oh, yeah. Well, Does does she get the (laughs) $24,000? But that has been the message for years, that the umpire's job is to sit there and take it. And this time, they made an example. And he's been glib about it. It's not that it's happened and he's feigned remorse. He's been absolutely glib about Mm -hmm. it every single time. To the, to the effect of, this is just who I am. Don't you know me by now? Yeah. Take it or leave it. So yeah. we will gladly leave it. I was watching a tennis channel, quickly, a tennis channel panel. And Martina Navratilo was there, John Wertheim, uh, Brett Haber. And poor Brett Haber said a perfectly reasonable thing. Said, do you think that we have been complicit in this because we haven't condemned Fabio's comments? Or we've talked about it like he's amusing because he's entertaining and the whole panel was like no which is absolute bullshit wow martina she's like no i'm not complicit like let's take a step back and listen to the question think about it intellectually has tennis channel been complicit in this sort of behavior and i think you'll come to a different answer i can't believe brett was shut down so thoroughly but that sort of deep thinking doesn't really happen on broadcast tv so i don't know what i was expecting the the other thing that we'll talk about, the last thing we'll talk about quickly as a request from regular listener Anna Marseille is this whole handshake obsession in women's tennis. And this was brought about this time by Ostapenko and Kazetkina. Again. And another flyby <laughs> yeah. from Yelena. And, you know, if, if you're watching an Ostapenko match and she loses... Watching for the handshake is something that's it's entertaining because that's who she is at this point. Mm-hmm. Like we know that she is quite rude <laughs> in defeat. Like she has a long as long as one can have as just a twenty year old, she has a long history of being pretty damn rude mm-hmm. in defeat. Right? Uh, yeah. So there was extra color to this match because this was the Charlton Charleston final, which Kazakina won. And Ostapenko gave a, not a very gracious speech. There was no uh, congratulations to her opponent at the Charleston final. But I think the question was, why are we so obsessed with handshakes and not the actual tennis yeah, that's going on, right? Yeah, there's a right? Twitter thing that's always, I'm just here for the handshake. Mm-hmm. And let's be real. Like a lot of, I can't say definitively what the ratio is in terms of how much it happens on men on the men's tour as opposed to the women's tour, but I know for sure that a factor of it being more in the public conscious for the WTA is because 
of how we've conditioned ourselves to look for it. Mm -hmm. It's not that it doesn't happen in men's tennis. The Zverev Chorich handshake yeah. wasn't okay. quite as much of a flyby but it as Ostapenko. But this was one of the main favorites for the men's title, losing in the second round. And like what we've said about him and his demeanor recently, he's been a little bit snippy and kind of rude. Mm. And, you know, there's similarities there between him and Ostapenko. So, like, why didn't get that? Why didn't <laughs> that get as much attention? Right. And so, in some ways, I don't feel that you and I have a leg to stand on here because we we, we talk about what well, we it. do. And we talk about more than just the tennis, right? We talk about yeah. the drama and shade and all these things. And um, I did photograph the handshake between Makarva and Kerber in Cincinnati. Yes, yeah. The thing, the handshake that I will talk about is Coco and Radwanska because it encapsulates who Coco is, at least who she presents to the world. So the match is over. Radwanska challenged the last ball. She's waiting at the net to shake Coco's hand. Once the challenge goes off, Coco turns around, leaves her, and celebrates and does her stupid jockey macho bullshit, and then comes back to shake. Aga's hand after all that's done so Radwanska just like standing in the net waiting I mean just utter classless like she's so clueless Coco I definitely wonder what the hell is wrong with Coco a lot of the times and that's a good example of like how could you be so socially inept in that moment it was just a total lack of decorum back to the matter of ha at hand mm. the whole I'm just here for the handshake thing it is, we agree, it is problematic. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now here's Rene Denfeld. He was on the show back in, I want to say April, when uh, the WTA was in Stuttgart for Maria's, well, they weren't in Stuttgart for Maria's return. Maria okay. was in Stuttgart and <laughs> it was weren't? her return. And Rene was there on site. He's in, in uh, New York at the US Open for the first time. He's kindly agreed to come back on the show. Enjoy. Hey, Renee, welcome back to the Body Serve. Hello. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Great. How are you? Thank you so much for uh, coming on so late. That's all right. That's good. I'm still doing a bit of stuff anyways, faffing about uh, compiling some things for essentially what is now the morning in Germany. So um, all good. Yeah. Now, listen, you were on our show the last time when Sharapovo first came back in Stuttgart. And now you're back on the Body Serve to tell us about... Well, this is not what we talked about, but it just so happens that you're here when she's playing her first Grand Slam back as well. So you're our, you're yes. a Sharapova correspondent, pretty much. It's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it is her first Slam back. It's her first... Uh, yeah, it's going pretty well for her so far, I suppose, right? So um, it's it's definitely an interesting... An interesting tournament from from but not just from that angle from 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 a lot of angles which i'm sure that has not gone past people it's been it's been a bit of a wild one i suppose yeah yeah what is the chatter like on the ground uh, regarding sharapova are people just generally excited to see her back or because the espn coverage has been pretty rapturous i would say um i feel like overall I feel she got a pretty good reception reception from the crowd. Mm. I feel that there's a decent buzz when it comes to her around the grounds. But also, I've not been on the grounds that often. So yeah. I've, been, <laughs> I've been in here for quite a while in the media center. So a um, bit tough to say what the vibe is across the grounds. But like overall, I think she's, yeah, she's one of the, like, one of the players that, uh, that are the yeah, she's one of the faces of the tournament. I think that's very fair to say. How has this time around differed from when she first came back in Stuttgart for you personally being at both tournaments? It is less... I felt Stuttgart as an overall experience very stressful and very... not. Well, it sounds like I've been... I don't know, hugely emotionally invested and it's been draining and everything, but like for a premier tournament to have like this sort of it, 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 it was a lot. It was a lot for a Premier Tournament. And I think within the spectrum or within the scope and within the size of a slam, 
this feels this feels okay this feels right this feels it, it does not feel out of whack or it doesn't feel like um um i don't know just just crazy and out of blown out of proportion Stutt- stuttgart felt very out of its own proportion mm. this year and this has been it's yeah it the set the sort of storylines that have been going on like for like with her come back in stuttgart obviously that yeah there was a lot of new ground that was being uh yeah that was being sort of unfolded or discovered or whatever you want to call it and i feel a lot of that talk has been i wouldn't say put to rest but it's not as much in the in 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 the um in the spotlight here um this time around and here at the open i they're still sure there's still some chatter about her getting that wild card her being on our thrash for each of her matches but um it it's not the sort of it's not like the entire conversation hinges upon that. Right. And I feel like there's just a lot of Sharapova fatigue. You know, there wasn't really the outrage about the wild card this time around. Um, I think a lot of people have just decided to move on, right? I don't know if it's Sharapova fatigue, but I feel like it's just general fatigue <laughs> of, of, being, of mm. being contentious about many, many different topics like whether whether you should be contentious about them or whether you should just accept them for what they are that's that's an entirely different discussion but i think people are just there's there's a certain element where people are just it's the end of a season the season has been long it's been a very eventful season things have been happening on all fronts and i feel there's a sense of i I think it it kind of correlates with a certain exhaustion that mm. rolls around after seven months of a, of a slam of, 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 a, of a tennis season and um, that's maybe why people aren't firing off into all directions about for example the the entire sharp over topic right I don't know how much you've been able to be aware of what some of the coverage has been like on TV and whatnot but I feel like there's been an inconsistency and kind of a I don't really know how to talk about her doping ban from some of the commentators <laughs> to the point where, for example, Cliff Drysdale is adamant that he's going to say doping suspension every single time. Mm. Whereas Chris Everett on air last night, she even went to say, you know, one big difference with Maria this time around is she's so much more quick around the court since she took those 15 months off. <laughs> <laughs> Which is yeah, two I, vastly yeah, I'm, I'm different ways to frame it. Of, yeah, I'm aware that this has been sort of. Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's been all over the shop. That, but the way that different people have been sort of describing her 15 months ban as after her break, <laughs> or that there's there have been very very different layered levels of euphemisms going into the description of these 15 months from all sorts of different sorts uh, sources and and people yeah i that much i do i i have noticed even though i have not listened to a lot of i'd say courts with with commentary or a lot of commentary now is this your first time covering the us open it is the first time covering the us open for me yeah so how's it been so far Long days, sleepless. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't say sleepless, but it's. Um, I mean, I don't. I don't have the typical commute. I think that a lot of people have. A lot of people here have got the Manhattan out to Queens commute, which can take between twenty minutes up to ninety minutes. Um, I'm spending most of the time on the LIRR, the Long Island Railroads, uh, mm. which is, which can be quite convenient actually, because like at least most of the time. I know, like, if I leave the house at 10.10 and bike to the next train station, I'm going to be here at the very latest by 11.10. So it's like one hour door to door. Um, Not too bad, actually. Not too bad. And in general, it's, uh, yeah, it's been interesting. It's been long hours. I'm not really, I mean, I'm used to night sessions from a couple of other tournaments, but it, it tends to be fairly late here and especially getting back to, I don't know your hotel, your um, or wherever you're staying uh, can be can be a bit tricky sometimes. Not tricky because they they do offer transport and all of that, but it can be very late. How does it compare to the other slams that you've covered? Uh, never done Australia, never done Wimbledon as as media. To be fair, only done the French in here. Um, it feels it, it's definitely louder. It's like when you 
I think what most players say is fairly is is pretty accurate. You walk across the grounds. There's um, you smell food. You smell there, there's all sorts of things going on. It's a bit louder. Um, it goes on well into the night. Um, just just the sort of people come for different things. I think at the French people come mainly for the tennis and here they also come to be entertained but i think that's not that's also a sort of a cultural thing as well because in the us it's, it's about the sports but it's also like about the value that's going on or that that's added uh, surrounding the experience that you want to have or that i know that the tournament wants to provide for um for the uh for the spectators and for the audience and for the for the crowd so i think in that way it does differ quite a bit from from uh from the french at least and uh can't really make a call about about uh wimbledon or um or about the aussie opening when it comes to that so we've been hearing a ton about denis shapovalov here in canada and we weren't sure how crazy the the conversation was in the u.s about him but now i think he's the fourth or fifth odds makers favorite in this totally decimated bottom half of the draw. Which still uh, seems crazy to me. Right. <laughs> like, that seems absolutely nuts. So is uh, is there chapeau fever in, in New York? I'm, I'm not sure if it's fever, but I think <laughs> it's definitely part. Like, it's one of the more... A little bit of uh, a one cold of sweat. Sort of stories that are, that's more <laughs> at, the, at the front. Definitely more at the front. Like, like why, would you, why else would you put basically a qualifier onto Ash? Mm-hmm. On, on two uh, successive uh, kind of um, um, rounds, right? So I feel there's definitely a bit of a buzz. There's definitely a lot of talk about him. There's some, there's some out, like I can't even say some way out, way out there predictions about him making the finals because, like, to me, pretty much any one of the eight guys in the in the round of sixteen in the bottom half feels like a way out finalist. So that kind of throws. That entire, like, all of that into the wind, anyways. But uh, yeah, there's there's definitely a bit of hype around him. There's definitely a fair bit of talk around him. And um, look, I, as as Venus Williams would say, if someone asked me like, who's gonna make the finals out of those? I'm like, girl, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, great because I was so, just yeah. about to ask you. <laughs> well, you're obviously covering specifically the German players, right? And in that bottom right. half. We've got the other Zverev, or as John McEnroe yeah. would say, the Zverev. <laughs> uh, so Misha is in the round of 16. He's got Sam Query next, the lone American male left in the men's draw. What are you thinking about his chances? I mean, you just said that anybody can do it, but I mean, this is really wide open. Okay, like, I'll start. I think there are a few guys who are more likely to do it. Like, if I had to make... A very educated guess. I'd probably go with Kevin Anderson overall, because I, I feel like out of out of all of these eight, he's been like maybe the most consistent over the hardcore season. I know Sam Crary won uh, won Los Cabos, but in general, I feel I feel like Kevin Anderson is fairly is a decent shout. Um, Misha, look, I think Misha can can go out in three to Sam Crary. Misha can win in three to. Against Quarry, uh, granted, Sam Sam's got a significantly better game off of the off of the ground and from the baseline than John Isner. Um, and Michel Zverev made fairly fairly short work of maybe a slightly slightly injured John Isner the other night. Um, but if 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 the if the chips fall his way, uh, he could easily be the Zverev brother to make a final here, which. No one would have seen coming if you <laughs> say like, "Oh, Zverev will be in the final." I'm like, "Sure, possible, <laughs> probably not this Zverev." So it's it's a it's a cool thing for him. It's uh, it, it'll be interesting to see like if he does indeed make it. I don't know to semifinals or even the finals. How that's just going to play out in terms of their dynamic as brothers on tour, and I I would find it fascinating and interesting, but it's also it's super tough to. It's super tough to tell because how, Alec, how all of this is going to go. Alex has, we saw him in Cincinnati. We were impressed with him in Cincinnati. And one of the things that we came up, came away with uh, from seeing and listening to him live was just how confident and 
cocky really he is. Like he mm. has this brashness to him that seems to be in complete contrast to his brother. And with the hype surrounding him coming into this tournament, like you said, it really would be interesting to see how that dynamic plays out going forward. Because he's even really snippy with press now when they ask him about his brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was there. Yeah, he did not take kindly to that at all. Um, yeah, he can be he can be quite brash. Quite uh, he can he, he tends to read into the questions that he's being asked. Um, like also his his press conference after he lost to Jaric, um there was I felt he was so I don't know absorbed which which I've not seen from him in a while he was so absorbed in his sort of in his frustration and his disappointment that it was tough for him to just basically make a real like a I wouldn't say to put to to put sentences together but he was just not in not in the mood to go into any like more detailed conversation and just yeah it was it was um it was a tough night i suppose for 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 the youngest Zverev, and it's going to be interesting to see if i don't know if he how he comes out of this in like he'll have a couple of months until the next slam he'll be in a i wouldn't say quite in the similar position next time around because there will be other names back in back in the draw probably a novak djokovic a, a an andy murray a Stan Wawrinka, so it's not going to be all on his shoulders, or like the spotlight won't be as as harsh on him or as as strongly on him as it was here because of the sort of like how was, how depleted the field had felt before the tournament started, and now like yeah, it's just pretty much everyone left the building except for Roger and Rafa and, and Dominic team. So <laughs> um, it's and, and Juan Martin Del Potro in terms of like who's done really well at slams over the past two years. And yeah, the only semi-finalist left in the bottom bottom half of the draw of a slam is Sam Querrey. Yeah. No finalist, no no slam champion, so who knows? What do you make of Rafa's slow starts in matches this week? Um, I don't like I don't know what I make of it. I find it interesting that he's basically admitted that he's got ner- that that he's getting super nervous at the beginning of matches, or he got he was super nervous like at the beginning of matches of the first two, and that he's not like he's not converting his chances at all and just gets t- almost tight on the big points like doesn't feel the ball doesn't doesn't really know where it's coming from as basically he's going with the well I don't know what it is but I'll just accept it and hope that it will help me get over it at some point but I feel like he's he's got a he's got a f- solid a, a, a workable draw I think that's the, the very nice way to put it he's got a very workable draw into the quarterfinals um, so maybe he'll sort it out, but I feel it, it just takes him a long, long, long time to, to get going. And if he runs into someone who's, yeah, a little more alert and awake at the beginning and a stronger opponent, I think he'll have, he'll have his work cut out if he keeps going on the way he's been going. Because what he's done is he's basically, I don't know, he he's been riding out the storm whether that is the storm of his own like substandard play or the good level of his opponent and then he gr- he started grinding them down which i suppose he does quite often but his starts here have felt pretty slow am i shocked by it not really because like he's not looked incredible in both um montreal and cincinnati so we'll see but i'm i'm not quite sure what to make of it because also he's not quite sure what to make of it fair enough <laughs> yeah i wonder how much of it is uh you know being 31 knowing that there are so many chances left and also looking at this draw and seeing how many of his biggest opponents are gone and then right? also seeing federer looking every bit of 36 in his first two matches mm. and him being likely his biggest obstacle to the title if he's playing well it was interesting today in the in the in the Swiss German part of, of Federer's presser at the end, he like because he said, "Yeah, I played pretty well tonight," and I thought it was interesting that he said, "Look, in Melbourne, I played two pretty rotten matches at the start of the tournament. Like he mm. played well against uh, he he didn't play well in the first two rounds. Like for example, against Jürgen Melzer, that was that was not not a lot to shout home about in a way. But what, what he said now, and I think that's that's a really fair call, and it also shows kind of where he is." in his head at the moment and mentally he's like 
does anyone really remember these two matches? What people remember is me basically uh, making ex making incredibly short work of Thomas Berdic, of, of, of winning my semifinals against Stam, winning winning the finals in five sets against Rafa, me winning a slam. Like people don't really remember like remember remember the first two two uh, the first two matches. Okay, this this is not verbatim. This is basically like the sort of mindset because the way that i said it right now makes it sound incredibly cocky <laughs> but um it's it's true like if i don't remember much like i was covering winter sports during <laughs> during australia anyway so my my memories of australia are fairly they're a bit different than most tennis fans i suppose but um yeah like it's about he got him he got through these first two matches i guess and today he looked he looked solid. He didn't look out of this world good, but he looked solid enough to get through the sort of field that is left here, I think. Now, as somebody who has been on the giving end of the GIF equation for mm. most of your social media life, I kind of flipped that on you this week <laughs> when I caught you in press because of the US <gasps> Open live feed and yeah. turned you into a GIF or a GIF. I still haven't I can't remember which is the correct pronunciation. Allegedly, it's GIF. Okay. But so you were you were GIFed this week. I was. <laughs> but I want to turn that into a larger discussion because this is something that we talked about privately afterward about what it's like to be aware that you're being watched in press. That's unique it's, to this tournament. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely unique. It's definitely something something different. It's um, I feel like it's best not to be too aware of it like because you're there working in a way so like it's it's it is what it is like sometimes you're going to react to someone saying something away oh interesting oh i did not see that coming and oh i disagree so i'm i'm i don't know i'm, I'm not sure if i'm blessed or if i'm i've been unfortunate to have rather strong facial reactions to things <laughs> so <laughs> in that case i definitely had a fairly strong strong reaction to it because i i was like mm, okay uh, okay if if that's how you see it that's and that's fair like i i guess it's um it is what it is i don't at first i was like oh oh no i don't want to be jiffed i don't want to be like i want to work here i don't want to be like in front of the camera myself but you stop thinking about it fairly fairly soon and you stop being too self-conscious about it i guess there's mm -hmm. another facet to that too though because in that specific moment, you were captured after having to repeat your question to a player. And I can I can attest to that, that it's a very nerve wracking experience because you think you've sat there with your question. You've probably gone through it in your head three or four times. You're ready for it to be asked. And then you have to come up in the, in the moment a new way to ask it so that it's understood by the player. Right. Yeah, it's awkward. It's basically because you're like you've got. I didn't speak up loud enough because I was sat fairly far at the back and I didn't speak up loud enough. So Rafa was like, uh, what, what did you say? And I was like, oh gosh. And there's nothing weirder than, I feel it's super weird than like if you've got to sort of ask it again and speak up because it's like, oh, you didn't, like, then you wonder, oh, did the player not understand it because I didn't, because you didn't speak loud enough or because you just asked it in a really weird or stu something in a really weird or stupid way or something like that. So that's just like something where you're like, uh, I kind of want to sink into the ground right now, just for a split second. <laughs> um, uh, kind of, it's a bit of, it's a sense of stress that's kicking in in a way. So, yeah, it's 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 awkward. You you never want a player to go, huh, or to go what, or, or something like that. You you want them to understand the question as uh, uh, as well as possible, and sometimes that doesn't happen, and sometimes it does. Now, a question you asked Naomi Osaka was actually responsible for one of the more unconventional responses of the week <laughs> about that great commercial we all know in North America. How does it feel to be responsible for mesothelioma? <laughs> it's beautiful that this got into a transcript. I think that's just <laughs> marvelous. <laughs> just wonderful. I think... I mean, most people know that Naomi Osaka is 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 a very is a, is a pretty funny and in a, in a very I don't know deadpan and and it's very of her generation, yes. I guess, um, yeah. in in the sort of humor that she 
she has and the way that she conveys it or that she tells a tale, I guess. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with more people. The more people know about like how funny she can be in press, I, that's cool. That's good. I inter- think- Sorry, I, I interviewed her in Charleston and James wasn't there. And so when I sent him the audio, I said, you have got to listen to this because he just assumed it was going to be your regular interview. You know, he'd heard some stuff about Naomi, but then I was like, this is like crazy funny. Like, this is <laughs> so good in all the ways you would never expect it to be. And Naomi, to me, it's funny because she, it doesn't seem like she's always aware that what she's saying is hilarious. Like this is just her and it happens to be funny. I think that's a fair shout. I think that, yeah, sometimes sometimes she's like, she just goes on and then she's like, oh my God, what am I even saying? And it's, and then she sort of, she catches, catches herself maybe because she actually, I don't know, she articulates what she thinks or whatever. And then she's like, oh my God, what am I telling these guys here? So it's always, <laughs> it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun. It's, um, it's very, ent- it, it's entertaining. And I think it shows, it, yeah, it shows up just how sort of, there are many, many layers, many facets to her and it's cool. It was good. It was good press. Definitely. Now, Fabio Fonini, <laughs> this mm. has been a long time coming that something of this magnitude, whether you want to say it's enough or not enough for him to have some, you know, sanctions levied against him that go beyond fines for his horrendous behavior. Yeah, I think this is... Um... Like, I mean, there will be some people who will say, oh, I don't know, this is too harsh or this is too soft or whatever. I feel, I feel it, it, to me, it feels right. I don't, maybe some are going to say, oh, this is, this is too much. But even if you think this is too much, think back or try and recall all the sort of stuff that he got away with. And that was just barely a slap on the wrist. And I think this is actually a proper slap on his hand so that, and, and it actually hurts. And um, I know there will be some people who say, well, this is terribly unfortunate for Simone Bolelli. I agree it is. But in a way, it's just like if you um, if you start a business venture with someone who's got the reputation of being just unreliable or of, of doing some crazy things, you got to you, you make that decision. You make that call to play with that person, to play with. Simone makes the call to play with Fabio. He knows that we all know that Fabio has the tendency to go, yeah, to go off of the rails here and there in terms of the things that he says to umpires, to or the, the way that he acts or the way that he behaves. And if something like that happens, then I guess that's the sort of collateral damage you, if you're collateral damage in that case, and I think that would be that that's what happened to Simone, then that's sort of within the. I don't know, within the spectrum of risk that you're willing to enter. And in typical no, Fabio... No, not really sympathetic there. Sorry. No, and in typical Fabio fashion, the apology was utter bullshit. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, why, why even go there to apologize when you just basically say at the end, like, it, it just... Well, when you go when you go and apologize and then you say oh but it's actually not all none of it is such a big deal it's just a, it's just hitting some balls between the lines it's like just then just don't even do it like just no nah. what's the point so we're not going to keep you much longer because we know it's late but maybe we can finish up with with some with what are some of your favorite moments from the first week so far i feel like the first night session is six weeks ago <laughs> yes <laughs> that's generally the thing i thought the entire um, Halep Sharapova match was uh, I thought that that was my favorite match of the tournament so far I think it was incredible in terms of just the entire buzz going into it and everything that surrounded it it was it could have easily been a final or a semi-final of a slam and no one would have batted an eyelid yeah I thought that was incredible like I know a lot of people have thoughts on the outcome or on on, on the entire scenario I suppose um I thought it was a great match. If you just look at if, if you look at the match, and in general, some of my favorite moments. I feel I'm gonna I'm gonna say what many of the umpires will probably say if you ask them. Like, what's your favorite thing about? Uh, what's the funniest thing that happens? They're gonna say it's the small things. It's the things here and there. Um, for example, like Naomi's response to like where her mind tends to go off to was hilarious. Um, Kaya Kanepi today was just 
wonderfully weird offbeat and just sort of it was just basically snippets of her past 18 months with some very interesting things like that she was sparring partner for the um discus champion in the olympics in uh, uh, from estonia get Kanter, and that she did um like car races on on ice and that she went to hawaii and then she thought huh i could play tennis again so it's like it's like <laughs> some just some the weird little bits on the side way that make you make you smile that like crack you up so i think these have been with those have been some of my my highlights so far and um yeah i'd probably need to sit down and just go through each day and just um just think think everything through at the end of this tournament and then i could give you a very a detailed list in terms of like my favorite moments but yeah some some small some the small things here and there uh the lack of sleep is not my highlight. That's just <laughs> very, that's a very bottom of the list. But um, yeah, I've been, I've sort of, I'm starting to replace the blood flow in my veins with uh, with coffee. So I'm I'm getting there. Spare a thought too for Simona Halep. Like my God, that is the most horrid luck of anybody all year <laughs> in it's tennis. Brutal. It's brutal. I'm like I said this before. I said this like during the match. I said this afterwards. I was like, this is just very very brutal luck um it's just it's just rough she's basically had this entire dd for example the number one dangled above her head like the the a grand slam win dangled above her head and for as great as her results have been since the start of the clay season and i think she's had really good results but yeah. um it's also been it's been very cruel i think like luck has been pretty cruel to her and um yeah, it's tough. It's tough for her. I'm, I'm curious to see how she's going to come out in Asia, uh, uh, how she's going to try and reset, restart, recalibrate. Like the good thing maybe for her is the number one, it's just it's 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 slightly more out of reach now for now anyway. So we'll see how this how this pans out for her. But yeah, I, I agree. Spare thought for her. I think she's been considering how well she's been playing. She's been dealt some very, very tough cards over the past couple of months. So I think we're going to leave it there and let you uh, get on the Long Island Railroad and go to bed. Uh, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be Ubering home. I'm oh, not gonna good go, idea. No, there's no train anymore, but I'm going to be Ubering home and then I'll fall into bed and then I'll wake up tomorrow morning at some point. We'll, we'll see when that is. <laughs> Refreshed. <laughs> well, as far as you can refresh. So right. it's just, just slightly with, with slightly less bloodshot eyes, I guess. <laughs> well, we very much appreciate your insight. And uh, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Renee. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Anytime. Thank you, Renee. Thank you to the listeners for tuning in to episode 95. 100 is fast approaching. I'm Jonathan. You can find me on Twitter at tennis underscore John. I'm James. I'm at Elliot JMR. Two L's, two T's. Shoot us uh, a note on Twitter at the Body Serve. That's where the podcast uh, Twitter is. And also give us a review on iTunes. Until next time.